why Jordan Peterson and why Carl Jung? Why do you think those two thinkers in particular are important to talk about? And, and you know, how do they resonate with, with you? Yeah, well, Jordan Peterson, um, I stumbled upon uh, a few years ago. I think the cat, actually, the first interview I saw of his was one on uh, some Canadian broadcast um, channel. And I was like, this guy's a curmudgeonly old man and whatever. He's just a typical <laughs> conservative, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I just ignored him for, you know, a, a few months or a year even. And then I saw his Kathy Newman interview, which went viral. And I was like, okay, this guy, you know, he knows some things. Um, I guess, you know, for me, when I was learning about Jordan Peterson and kind of going through his lectures and his interviews early on, it was in college. And that was at a time where I was struggling with a lot of mental health issues, to put it simply. Um, cause I think that, you know, you know, I struggle with mental health issues. Like, well, you go for many hours in therapy of what that means, but you know, yeah. um, you know, I was going through some difficult oh, times yeah. and he, yeah, well, it, 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 it's part of, it's part of my, you know, uh, what would you say journey through life and what's the phrase, um, heroes hottest journey. fires, oh. hottest, well, heroes journey, but I was gonna say hottest fires forward, strongest flame. So uh, yeah, hottest true. fires forward, strongest steel. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so, you know, him talking about these ideas of like meaning and very straightforward explanations of basic psychological concepts, you know, the idea that in order to feel positive emotion in order to get, you know, the, the rush of dopamine, you know, that you could get from cocaine or, or whatever, but that's obviously a suboptimal way, you know, you need to have goals and explaining, okay, you know, the the human mind is set up that when you move towards a value goal you get dopamine and then when you achieve the value goal you get ser serotonin which acts differently serotonin is satiating whereas dopamine yeah. is kind of the positive um you know uh neurotransmitter that that gives you that positive emotion and so stuff stuff like that that level of specificity i thought was really helpful um i think i also reson resonated with his communication style so the example that i always go to is there's one video of him talking about, okay, if you're depressed or have anxiety, you know, one of the things you should do is you should eat breakfast. And mm -hmm. I don't, and he, and he says, he says, high protein breakfast, right? Yes. High fat and protein. And he high says, fat, high protein, yeah. yes, yes. And he says, um, I didn't say enjoy your breakfast. I said, eat it. Those aren't <laughs> the same thing because for me, I, I had never really eaten breakfast. Um, and because I, I, you know, I kind of woke up with stomach aches. And I was like, I'm, I'm not hungry right now. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to eat anything. And his point was like, and just his style of communicating was, no, 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 look, I'm not telling you to eat your breakfast to enjoy it. I'm telling you to eat your breakfast in order to get, you know, the, the energy so you feel less anxious um, later in the day. And that distinction, that kind of, you know, wag your finger distinction of eat your breakfast, don't enjoy it, eat it. It's like that, that I resonated with that because it was kind of like, okay, this is, you know, it, it's, it's cutting through your kind of rational objections or whatever. Um, and so just a lot of his practical psychological advice I found valuable, which spilled into um, what I think is the most valuable thing for me as someone who's just interested in, you know, the, the, the fundamental mysteries of the universe, to put it, uh, you know, poetically. But his, his, his philosophical work in terms of his work with, you know, maps of meaning and understanding sort of the evolutionary value and uh, development of religion and how that uh, plays into individuals' lives and, you know, what the implications are for, you know, your ind individual's life, but also society and all that. That's what I found to be the most compelling aspect of his work. And then, you know, Jung is obviously a big part of that, this concept of the archetypes. I've always been big into fiction and big into, you know, like, fantasy world, Star Wars, Game of Thrones, that type of stuff. And, you know, having learned more about the archetypes and, you know, like Peterson makes the point of when you go to a movie, you know, you're interested in it, but, but you don't know why you're just, it, you just watch it and you're, you're engaging it and you have an emotional response and all that, but, but you don't question why and nobody ever asks and going into the detail of what's being portrayed on screen are patterns of behavior that are, you know, that we've, we've essentially evolved to detect, we're adapted to, you know, kind of uh, imitate. So that would be the hero's journey, right? In the, in the broadest sense, although it can be specified. Um, but 
you know, seeing how, okay, well, you know, what in Star Wars or what in Game of Thrones or something like that, which is this abstract fantasy world that seems totally detached from reality. And people would often call it escapism, which I don't buy. I don't buy good art as being escapist. Um, you know, I think that I that has in, that that has just enriched my experience of even just, you know, watching movies or, or TV shows or or whatnot. And, you know, it, it grounds these more kind of abstract emotional uh, concepts in something real and that, you know, that enhances them. And so. Yeah. So, yeah, that's I'd say that's uh, where Peterson and Jung have have played a role in, in my thinking. Yeah, I, I would certainly say I've had a similar journey because um, I kind of came across Peterson when I was about 19, 20, probably. Um, okay. How old are you now? I'm 24. Okay. Go. Yeah. So, uh, and look, I never personally had any, uh, let's call it mental health issues or, or anything of that that nature. Sure. But look, man, um, the world is a complicated place. We we all need direction. We all need, we all need some sense of meaning, right? And right. Certainly, he was he was really helpful, and he still is. I, I shouldn't speak in past tense. Uh, sorry, not not to make this all about me. <laughs> no, uh, by all means, I'd be, I I'd be interested so, here uh, your perspective yeah, too. Yeah. By the way, uh, you probably noticed. I'll, I'll look to the side or I'll look at look at my book, my notebook. It's just because when you're talking, I'm taking down some notes, and I don't want to interrupt. You want to follow up? Yes. There, no problem you at said, all. You said two things, Paul. You said that he's straightforward. His sort of practical psychology. Do you view Peterson? At this moment, I'm not talking about him, let's say, uh, prior to his public acclaim, more of, as more of a sort of a self-help quasi-intellectual or as a, a genuine Noam Chomsky type public intellectual. Where do you, where do you view him? Yeah, well, I definitely say the latter, although he, he appeals differently. So, for example, I have, I have friends who are not really that interested in the philosophical work that he puts forward, Right. They're, they really like him and they really watch, you know, the 10 minute clips on YouTube or, or whatever on, yeah. you know, here's why you need a schedule or, um, you know, here, here's a example of animal behavior that maps on the human behavior and here are the implications for your life, right? Like that, that very practical kind of self-help type stuff. Um, but, I, but, I, but, and certainly that's valuable and I've gotten a lot of value out of it, but I still think that his philosophy, his worldview I think it's transformational in a significant way. I mean, I think he is reviving or not reviving. He, I think he's reforming religion in a, in a real sense. So I think he, you know, I don't think it's, un, perhaps it's unreasonable at this point in time, but 50 years from now, I don't think it will be unreasonable to consider Jordan Peterson on having um, a similar kind of impact, perhaps not to this scale, but maybe of someone like Martin Luther you know, who reformed the, uh, the Catholic church. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's the philosophical aspect of, okay, uniting science and religion, you know, real science is the domain of the objective world and religion is the domain of the ethical world. And there's a, you know, a Hume's guillotine in it, it, that you can't overcome, right? You can't derive an art from it is science can't tell you how to live your life. And so he's kind of synthesizing those two, but then, what I think is interesting, and he's pointed this out, is you know he arose at a time right when podcasts began taking off, right when you know Joe Rogan is the most, I think he's the most popular media figure that has ever existed in the entirety of the human race. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I believe that's correct. Right? And Jordan Pearson's like good friends with him, you know. I, so I was gonna, like, I was gonna interject because I thought you were gonna say he's the most popular figure right now. I was gonna say no, no, no. I was gonna inter interject no, human no, history, human history. Yes, yeah. <laughs> right, right. I think it's, I think it's a. A billion per year, I think his listeners are at, or something like that. It's close to. Um, I could be wrong. It's definitely in the hundreds of millions. Um, but but you know the point that Peterson makes is, you know he, he his rise to fame and his rise to prominence got carried on this new technological change. Podcasts people can listen while they're you know working or driving a truck or doing chores or something like that, and that's akin to Martin Luther, you know when he. Uh, sent his his treatises or whatever it was exactly um, with the printing press, right? The printing press scaled up and you know spread these ideas over, all over the world. And now to, I think Peterson points out the spoken word has as much reach as the written word. And so you know I don't think it's unreasonable to think that his influence, uh, you know, is transformative in a global sense. Certainly the amount of people he speaks to directly, 
is 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 up there in the millions. Um, but you know, I see, I see, I can't be certain, but I see hints of his like language or his thoughts in other like like other random you know people on YouTube or or public figures. You know, the Archbishop of the cat or one of the Archbishops of the Catholic Church, uh, Bishop Barron, yes, he's in yeah. regular conversation with Jordan Peterson, right? So it's like the the, the scope of his influence. You know, and whether or not it's his ideas or his his way of articulating those ideas, because the ideas are you know far older than he is. Um, that's that's where I think that's where I think his philosophical work has value that is above and beyond just the practical kind of self help type stuff. Yeah, yeah, and and this is where Paul and I mean I'm sure you 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 kind of at least I at, at least intimate this, but. I certainly am coming from a place of of love towards him. Like I, I genuinely care about the guy. I never he this probably he probably not probably he certainly doesn't even know that I exist. But because he's helped me so much, I certainly care for him. And I right. I think sure. he's a genuinely. I don't know what good means certainly, but I think he he's a person who's at least striving towards the good and then the noble yes. and the virtuous, whatever. Yes. That is. Yes. Yes. What, what, right. Whatever good means. It's like well not bad that's that's good enough right it's yeah, like whatever yeah, he's yeah. doing he's he's working towards something positive now what you know positive. he makes and, mistakes and, and whatnot and certainly but. not not trying to manipulate or play some kind of game so uh and yes. that's where i've been i've been thinking i would say i only started seeing this in him in the last year or so now i don't know if this was all this was always the case and i just noticed it about a year ago I'm I'm getting this feeling that because he's sort of being ostracized by the left, let's say, and the right has just taken him taken him in at like our, like our public mm-hmm. intellectual, you know, he's the guy you who's who's the who's a so called intellectual who speaks for right right wing values right. and that that two American right wing values, which is a bit more different to re, to the rest of the world. Um, have you? I've been getting the sense that he's becoming a bit dogmatic in his views. For me, isn't something a intellectual, especially an intellectual, uh, should should be uh, and and should kind of embody. Have Have you been getting that feeling, or am I just reading him wrong? I think uh, I think you're right. I think you're onto something with that because I think, like for example, I don't know if you saw. You know, he tweeted out that Sports Illustrated tweet yeah. about the model who he didn't yeah. find attractive, which I thought was kind of a was was a, was a bad tweet. I disagreed with him on that. I understood his underlying point, like you know, you, you can't like, stop glorifying obesity and un- unhealthy behavior. But yeah. the example he used, I didn't think was a good example. Um, and when when he was asked about it by uh, Michaela, his daughter, he said something to the effect of. You know, not, you know, my point was not, not everyone's a creative genius, not everyone's a super, uh, super athlete, and not everyone is a Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover. And if you don't like it, fuck you. And he like <laughs> shouted that out, you know, and like, okay, I, I get that. Right, exactly. I, exactly. And he's definitely someone who has a lot of anger. You can see that. Um, and so to your point, yes, I do think he's, he's gone from like pure exploration of ideas to a little bit more or maybe a lot more dogma, you could say. Now, the question is, what's the effect of that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I, I, and I, I kind of struggle with this in terms of, you know, if you're exploring ideas as like an intellectual, you, know, you, 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 need, you need to strip all dogma away, right? You, you need to use the best tools that you have available to you intellectually or philosophically and acknowledge that those are the best tools, but those aren't 100% correct, right? But Peterson, now that he's in, a, I would say a more political space, you know, he's interviewing politicians, he's, he's, he's making, def, you know, definite statements that have to do with policy or different, you know, political positions that level of dogma and assuredness, I think is in part necessary. And so I think what he, you know, you know, God knows what's in his mind, but like, you know, I could see it being, things are so dire now that, he, you know, he may not have all the right answers, but the answers he has are, are good enough. Mm. Going back to what we were talking, right? In terms of like, well, you know, I, I don't know what the, you know, I don't know what the ultimate nature of reality is and the ultimate nature of, of, you know, what, what the human experience 
is like or should be. But I certainly know that, um, you know, uh, performing double, double mastectomies on 13 year old children is not a good thing. And we should exercise restraint in that. I certainly know that the censorship of free speech is not a good thing. I certainly know that, you know, uh, government seizing the bank accounts of, you know, private citizens who are uh, protesting is not a good thing, right? And it's like, that's an area where, well, but what, but, you know, could, could you make a case that seizing the, the banks and could you make a, could, you know, what, as someone who believes in free speech, shouldn't I be willing to engage with someone who's against free speech? It's like, yes, paradoxically, but no, because I can't engage in free speech with someone who doesn't actually believe in free speech because that's the precondition for even be, beginning to have that conversation, right? So that level of dogma, I think, has to be there to some degree when you're moving out of a purely intellectual domain and into a prescriptive kind of more political um, domain, which is, I think, where he's going. And I think, you know, I think it's, I think to some degree it's necessary. He's, he's got a large audience and a large influence. And, you know, if he's, if he's influencing policy in positive ways, certainly positive from my perspective, that's, that's necessary. And I think it just comes at the trade-off of, well, he, he's not, he's not in this, you know, you know, Buddhist, like, we're just going to purely explore the, you know, uh, nature of reality and, and ideas and whatnot. He's kind of putting his foot down, which I, I think there's some necessity to that. But you're definitely right. I definitely think you've, you're, you've caught on and I've caught on the same thing. Yeah. In fact, Paul, I want to say, you know, you said that he is getting a bit angry and you can see that he's got a bit of anger, Ang anger, not, not repressed, but he's got, a, he's holding on to a bit of anger. Sure. It's certainly not repressed. It comes out, yeah. you know, pretty, pretty often. In a, in a funny way, that makes me like him more. And yeah, that yes. makes me connect to him more because for me, that's what it means to be human. Yes. In, in contrast to some of these, yeah, as you said, Buddhist or, or very spiritualist type self-help gurus that like, they, they, yeah. they're like airy-fairy or floating in the sky kind of. It, it just seems like they're detached from reality. And, and right, I'm a right. Nietzschean, so I don't like anything that sort of, this, if, if anyone has a goal to transcend the world, I find that in a very peculiar way to be rather yes. anti-human or, or anti-life. Anti yes. Because I like that Peterson's all about affirming life and, and truly living in this world right now. Um, yes. I think like Sam Harris is a good example. Well, maybe a good example of something like that, or at least how I kind of interpret what you're saying. Because Sam Harris, like I've never seen Sam Harris tear up. I think I've seen tear up once yeah. slightly in a TED talk but like P when Peterson talks and he spontaneously breaks down you know people criticize that but you know I whatever I think that's silly um it just shows he can't you know. exactly exactly and, and even if he's wrong which like I like I disagree with Peterson on you know on some fundamental things I think um and certainly the way he approaches things you know, the Twitter uh you know the the tweet about the Sports Illustrated model being an example it's like, okay, yeah, you know, this guy, like you said, this guy's not playing games. He's like, he's spontaneously breaking down as he says it. He's clearly emotionally invested in it. And something that's important for me to your point about people who kind of want to, you know, let's only exist in this ideas domain or this spiritual domain. It's like, you know, we're embodied creatures. We're, we're emotional creatures first. And rationality is, 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 is like the last, you know, yeah, stage like, of what is far more ancient in us. Yeah. Right. So to, so to pretend like, yeah, 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 exactly. So to pretend that we can have just a purely rational conversation, only approach things intellectually, I, I think is just wrong. And, you know, like one example I always sticks in my mind is Sam Harris. I think it was after the Black Lives Matter riots. He said something to the effect of, he said, the only tool that we have for changing people's minds is conversation. And I don't agree with that. I think you can change people's minds with art or, you know, just even... Uh, more emotional means of communications. Uh, not like, you know, I don't mean to say, you know, screaming and crying will get, will get your way, but I mean, appealing to that human instinct is far yeah. more compelling than just a purely logical and rational approach. And I think that's what art does, going back to the kind of the archetypes and what it's like, you tell a good story and it will change people's perception of, of the world. And so, yeah, that, that, that attempt on the part of people to disembody their perceptions and their ideas I, I, yeah, I would regard that with suspicion, you know, of just like, yeah, it's not possible. So, so, you know, for you to sit there, and, I'm just arguing the logic and the facts. It's like, well, you're not because 
you're here doing it and you have some emotional drive or impetus to be to be in this conversation to begin with right yeah because you know and i'm glad you brought up that point about the, the people who say you know again um, um what's his name steven pinker brilliant guy you know just certainly a brilliant guy but he he talks about reason and he talks about um you know the the value of rationality as if firstly as if that's something we are naturally well he doesn't really say this but he talks about it as if oh i could just go to the supermarket and buy it off the shelf or just it's, it's like buying groceries or something it's not just yeah. something uh one could just at once take a pawn uh right. because human beings were complicated creatures but also here's something i've realized i don't even know if reason a, a, a purely reason based uh let's say way of mapping mapping our world and also conducting ourselves in this world is a good thing because for me that's what a sociopath would be or, or yeah. a psychopath because yeah. they're emotionless they're soulless these empty creatures uh kind of like so I'm a, I'm a software engineer and, and like what, what we do is we, we build models right so i do a bit of uh machine learning stuff certainly that for me that's what uh that's what it's just, just an agent that exists in this world without without that that uh that almost ineffable sublime sense of being human that even though we try to put words on it we can't truly articulate it which is why as right. you said paul we need like art we need well certainly art but we also need tragedy to 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 know what it feels like to be human mm -hmm. um no nah, no nah, that, that 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 is interesting because you know it seems like a lot of what do you Okay, let me let me ask you this: a very very vague, open-ended question. But sure. since we're here, my what, favorite. What, you, what does it mean to be an authentic person? Mm. I think one. Um, there's a good there's a good line from a book. I forget the title of it, but it stuck with me. Is like authenticity. I don't know if it's authenticity or, or what the word exactly was, but the freedom to experience emotions in the moment, um, I think was, it's like described as the opposite of, of depression, I think, because it was a book about kind of psychology and mental health. Um, and that, that, that sticks with me in terms of what does it mean to be authentic? It means, you know, being able to, in this moment, articulate exactly what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling um, without, you know, bias or prejudice or some sort of, ulterior motive or something like that just purely being able to engage in the moment with what's in front of you um and in, in i think in order to be able to do that you have to orient yourself in the proper direction right because the idea you know i think the idea is like you know you have to do the hard work philosophically to kind of fit what are your morals what you know what are my values what am i what am i pursuing what am i after and once you've kind of thought that out and then started embodying that and kind of orienting your life towards a, a positive valued goal, right? An ethical one. Then, then that frees you up to act in the moment, right? Where it's like, you know, like in, like in, like in this conversation, right? You know, but I am interested in, in learning and growing my, you know, as a person, I'm interested in having conversations with, with different people, um, with putting my ideas out there and whatnot. And, you know, th like, with that as the goal, now I can just sit here and just answer the question, you know, completely. I'm not trying to come out here and put on a persona and be like, well, you know, I'm on um, Rahul's podcast. So, I, you know, if I want to get more viewers, I got to, you know, tell good jokes or something like that or make really, you know, really good points that I planned out ahead of time. It's just like, yeah. no, I'm just going to be in the moment and, and, and orient myself towards something, towards something positive. And to me, that's, that's, that's authenticity, you know, not trying to well, what do I think Rahul and his audience might like to hear? So I'll kind of lean towards that versus, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll trust that, you know, whatever anyone wants to hear is the most honest and authentic thought in my head at any given moment. Right. And, and I think that's kind of um, like authenticity, which is, I think a powerful um, concept. And I think I liked someone, I think it was Teal Swan, who was like this kind of spiritual guru type person. Um, she said something to the effect of that I think is true, despite her being um, maybe having some flaws in other areas. Is like <laughs> the, the 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 true um, 
goal of human life is not enlightenment, but authenticity, right? Not, to not be an enlightened self, but an authentic self, right? It's not attaining some mystical level of existence. It's, you know, reaching deep inside you and kind of connecting with whatever was there, you know, at, at the birth of, you know, you as a person or, or take it back to the birth of life or whatever, if you want to get all archetypal and whatnot, but that's what I think of authenticity. Yeah, I think didn't Carl Jung call that uh, circumambulation? Circumambulation, yeah, right. Getting oh, so. kind of closer and closer in circle to the to the self, exactly. the true self. Exactly. And you see that a lot in uh, like Buddhism and some other Eastern religions where it's acted out. I believe that deeper, deep archetype. It's it's, right. it's fascinating. Well, on on Carl, Carl Jung, I'm really really keen to get to this because here's where I want to. Sure. I think most of this conversation really, apart from Jordan Peterson. Um, would be i don't know where this is going to go would i think it's going to be symbols and then modernism and postmodernism because that's what Mm. interested me from from your work and your your, your videos so okay i I guess you kind of explained to me i i I totally resonate mate with the whole what you said about jordan peterson and i i think certainly uh his again fame and acclaim is is warranted it's 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 also as you said a bit um bit fortuitous but at the same time it's what he's saying you know Mm. it's like if you give any idiot a microphone it's not like people are going to listen to him Uh, oh but who knows sometimes Sometimes. yeah (laughs) Yeah. it it has happened in 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 the past yeah Uh, human beings we're we're funny creatures um so let's get into you a bit deeper uh what what i guess from, from the archetypes and just from the overall jung jung's work what do you think it, you know speaks to you just purely mm-hmm. subjectively what do you think speaks to you mm-hmm. and what yeah do you think- well yeah well and, and and let me preface of course i am by no means a union scholar despite my name pf young i just there's a variety of reasons i chose that name although i i think I, you know I've, I've delved into Jung's work um certainly just reading his different books more so than any anyone else i think um Definitely, I, I think the thing that resonates most is, is this idea of archetypes. You know, it's that it's in the same domain of the kind of platonic forms that there is some essence out there that, you know, we, we respond to, you know, the, 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 this idea of a collective unconscious, right? That, um, and this is not necessarily a unique idea to Jung, but the, you know, we're not born blank slates. We're born with a lot of pre, uh, pre-wired pre-wiring you could say um and you know th- th- just like like the idea is like like of a like of a shadow right the fact that there is a there is a um a side of every individual that is un you know tapped yet and yet or is un, is not integrated yet still acts you know and so what's in your shadow is sort of you know what what is what is driving you in a lot of ways. Um, so, for example, like you know, I used to think of myself as not a very angry person. I, I worked at a bar in college, and people would spit on me and yell at me and stuff. And I kind of enjoyed it because I kept my cool very easily. Because it was like these are drunk people, whatever. I, you know, I'm having almost fun, and it was more interesting to have a drunk person, you know, yelling at you rather than just sitting there out there by yourself or whatever. Um, and I would see my coworkers get like upset and you know, like, I'd be like, you, what are you a child? Like this guy's a drunk guy and you're getting pissed at him. Um, and it, you know, and it turns out, you know, in moments of frustration with people or, you know, with the world or with current events or whatever, I found that, okay, well, I actually have a lot more anger than I thought. And so, um, you know, me feeling justified and saying, oh, this person's a cockroach or something like that, or blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, that feels good, but um, that was my, that was, that was, that was a part of me that was, um, controlling my actions and then providing justifications for them, you know, sort of without my acknowledgement. Cause mine is, well, if I'm calling someone, I'm not someone who gets angry. So if I call someone a cockroach, they must deserve it. It's like, no, that's not, that's not true. It's not, um, the right way to think about it. Um, I think, uh, you know, on, on, on this idea of shadow work, um, the idea that, 
you know, and again, kind of broadening it out from a human history perspective, kind of ex exploring what is the, what is our nature as human beings? What is the nature of reality itself? Jung's idea that I think is pretty powerful is that, you know, human consciousness, it's a very hard idea to explain. I'm not going to explain it very well, but it's essentially the idea that every individual's life journey, every individual's experience, conscious experience of life is the recapitulation of human evolution. So what that means is there's this term called, I believe it's, um, on, I think it's ontology, oh, what is it? It's ontology repeats philology or it's something to that effect. I, I don't think I have it exactly right, but it's the idea that it's, it's, an, it's a, um, it's a um, biological development term. It's, so if you have an embryo, right? That, that's, you know, um, growing in you know, a woman's womb or any animal, the stages of growth as the embryo kind of develops, it, it, it basically recapitulates our evolutionary history. So if you look at a, an embryo like a week in, you know, after fertilization, it looks like a, a, like a frog. It looks like a primordial amphibian. And then it looks a little bit more, has more um, shape like a dolphin or something like that. Or it, 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 even though I know we're not direct descendants from dolphins. Um, but the idea is an embryo, as it develops, it sort of quickly recapitulates our entire phylogenetic history. And uh, consciousness is the same way where, you know, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 years ago, we, did, we, we were still sort of in an animalistic nature, kind of like a childlike um, kind of perspective of, 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 of the world where we were more um, slave to our emotions. And as we develop, as the human um, kind of, as consciousness develops and as experience develops, we we pull more from that unconscious within us and integrate it into our consciousness. And we're recapitulating the, you know, the stages of conscious development. So, you know, the separation from parents, right? From, you know, is, is an archetypal idea. That's what initiation rights are that goes back. It's, it's like a universal concept. And we do that, you know, when we're in our youth and then we move into, you know, the messianic stage where now it's on us to, you know, make the world a better place and to go into the underworld and come back with, you know, uh, the, the treasure and make the world um, improve our world around us. And it's like these, these myths and mythology that goes back hundreds of thousands of years, if not even further. Every moment in our kind of our life, we are, we're operating within those archetypal structures. Our consciousness is nested within these sort of I don't know what you call them, mythological pathways. And as we grow and as we mature, we are essentially what we're doing is we're taking our conscious mind and, and diving deeper and deeper into our unconscious and pulling it to the front. That's what it means to kind of integrate and to circumambulate, right? Is we're, we're, we're pulling more from the unconscious conscious. And so that, that idea has stuck with me a lot. Um, and I think I need to develop it better. And I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to explain it, although it's not perfect. Um, oh, it's a, it's a difficult one. It's a complicated one. In fact, where did you, is there any particular book? Was it uh, the Red Book or, because I've heard someone else, or maybe I, I read it in some blog post, put put it in a similar way. Do mm -hmm. you know what the book is so that I can so, read it? So the one that, uh, so the, 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 the most valuable books by Jung, um, archetypes of the collective unconscious and man and his symbols. Those two have been the most yeah, um, influential on me, but the other, the, the other one in which I think it lays out pretty well is the origins and history of consciousness by Eric Neumann. Who Eric was a Neumann. Of Jung. I've got it, but yes. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. Yes. It's a, it's a thick, complicated book. And admittedly, I don't want anyone to think that I um, am, am more intelligent than I'm uh, appearing to sound. Uh, it's, it, 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 it is difficult. And I struggle with a lot of stuff. Um, but I found that going back and re and I haven't even, I haven't finished, um, the origins and history of consciousness. Um, but I've gone through the first, you know, half twice. And on the second pass through, when I see the first underlines I make, I go back and I, why did I underline this the first time? Oh, this connects with something, you know, okay. Now. And, and then I spend five minutes walking around my apartment, kind of thinking about it or whatever. Um, so origins and history of consciousness, I think, um, is, is a good introduction or at least the first half that i've been able to read and partially comprehend yeah. so far now i reckon books like that are they they aren't the kind of books where you can read page by page they're more referential books 
because yeah, I've got definitely. I've got a couple of books like that too. Like for example, uh, I'm currently trying to understand Kant and his mm-hmm. critique of pure reason. Yeah, I've never luck. read the book a book page by page. I've always mm-hmm. I just got to refer to it. You know, find find some yeah. chunk of an excerpt which which speaks to me or and I think that's the best way to study these books because they aren't. Uh, you know, let, let a leisurely <laughs> read. So, yeah, it's not a narrative, so to speak. Like, like, correct. like, like Jonathan Haidt has a good book, The Righteous Mind. That, and I just remember that being a book where it was just very, you know, you page turn. It was, it was factual. It was full of information, but it, it had a kind of a consistent, cogent, strong, yeah. cogent narrative, right? And then something like, yeah, Origins of History of Consciousness. That one is like, yeah, it's not as like I tried reading Nietzsche. I tried writing reading Beyond Good and Evil. I I, I can't do it. I, I just I'm I'm willing to say I'm not smart enough to be able to. I literally sat down with a pencil and I tried to go through it, you know, sentence by sentence. I, I think I'm someone who's much more amenable to. I, I'd rather hear a good educated lecturer talk about Nietzsche who can then provide context. You know, this phrase, uh, you know, at the time this is what this term meant because it can provide kind of additional context or something like that. Um, but like uh, Man and His Symbols is a book by Jung. That one's a pretty good one where it's, it, it's, it's, you know, they're all, they're all referential. They're all dense, but that one, it, um, you, you can kind of, kind of get through with, with some level of um, kind of coherent ease, I would say. Not that, you know, it's like any book you, you read it once you absorb maybe 10% of it, right. You got to read it at least three or four times at, at different points. And that's what I intend to do with some of these much more complicated tomes is like, well, let me get, let me get that very vague framework and then let me spend a year, you know, listening to Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and, and Friends to Wall and all these different people that are completely unrelated, so to speak, picking up new ideas. And then I have a new kind of free floating set of ideas that I can kind of resynthesize. Yes. With that, with that more complex uh, series of ideas. So, yeah, because I mean, we all need a map, isn't it? Because I would say, Paul, and I'm, I mean this sincerely right now, in many ways, by what you're saying it's kind of like a prelude for me to go and explore and build my own map because yeah, yeah, sure. if you don't have a map that would go insane how, how do we right. like, i can't even I, this is kind of what i mean again by the whole rationality and reason thing where hmm. i don't even know how to act purely by reason or purely by rationality i mean we need a map to live in this world and i don't know if the map that we create is it, 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 the axiom, so to speak, are propositions or or, or it's ana- analytically derived yeah, or, or drives or something, you know, that are just built into us or something. Right? Yeah, I think yeah. like I've, I, I like to think about it like the map, you know, you can create a really detailed map with rationality and, and pure science. But where do you go on that map? That That's that, that's not self-evident. Right. Mm. You, you can get a very detailed understanding of the world, but how you move in about it. It move you know around in it and where to go that that's not you cannot you know it's 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 the hume um hume's guillotine you cannot derive an ought from an is and I, I you know i i know sam harris tries to overcome that and i like sam harris a lot but you know and i think sam harris and jordan peterson they overlap a lot more than at least because I think of them like di- diametrically opposed, you know, in some sense, at least on some fundamental issues, but like they overlap so much that in some sense, they're just speaking a different language. And Sam Harris just kind of, you know, undercuts it with like, well, you just need curiosity. You don't need any religion. You don't need any, um, you know, stone age set of beliefs. You just need to be curious about your own experience. And it's like, maybe that's just a different way of, you know, of him offering an axiom that he doesn't even know because why be curious you know why not just pursue well, hedonistic pleasure oh well, what does curious mean like what does that entail right right because if right. you look at, like i'm sitting in this room right now and this you know not to make this a therapy session but this happens to me sometimes i i wake up in the morning and i just see all these things and i have like a moment where it just uh, have you read have you read any any Sartre, John Paul Sartre? No. Uh, any, so Sartre any has, detail. Yeah, Sartre has uh, this his book uh, Nausea, where the protagonist is Antoine Requentin, uh, I think Requentin. And um, look, I, I don't really resonate with a lot of because Sartre's whole philosophy is nothingness, being in nothingness. I never could res- mm. I, for me, the world never felt like it was nothing or that there was a void or it was a negation. Mm. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I felt my nausea, so to speak, 
came out of too much of meaning. I felt there were too many things in this world. Sure. And, and, and that kind of happens to me where I, I'd wake up in the morning and I, I think to myself, not, it doesn't have to be early in the morning. It's very like a cliche, but it can be any time of the day where there are all these things. What do I do? Like there are, it's just kind of like a paralysis by analysis, but, and, and, and some, and that's where I, I don't think I ever reason it out and be like, okay, I'm going to do this, then do this. I kind of just do, or just be to sound Heideggerian. Just, I just act. Mm. And then I, I don't know where that, uh, impetus to act comes from it just comes it just comes into my consciousness if you could put it that way so um no nah, it's 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 mysterious a bit 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 frightening but also fascinating <laughs> yes yes yeah right oh okay on symbolic thinking paul this is where i think you see i the postmodernists in many ways they are symbolic thinkers aren't they and how do we reconcile so this is where depends, I, I would say it depends on how you define symbolic but yeah go ahead well, <laughs> to I mean, sound like I, jordan peterson well no i mean fair fair enough because uh right. you know symbolic again right like we, so we spoke about archetypes then we have symbols are they the same thing mm. are they or are they Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, and, and you can ground all those in like metaphor, right? Is what I think what Peterson does. That's part of the, all this, met, you know, met, certainly human beings are metaphorical thinkers, right? Me, like me, like metaphorical cognition is is like a hallmark of human thinking. Um, and so if that, yeah, if that's, if, if by symbolic thinking, it's kind of in the same domain, then yes, just by being human, you, you know, you're required to think in, you know, concepts that don't have articulated definitions, right? Like, you know, like, like music is a, is a, is yeah. a, is a, is a concept. Um, but you can't define it. You can't define exactly at what point does this collection of notes become music? It's, it's, it's the def the definition is built into ex the experience of it. Right. And so we use, you know, it, you know, s s you know, s we symbolically represent music or, or, you know, we call things music, which is, you know, a symbol in some sense, not a visual symbol, but, um, but yeah, but I'm, curious what, what do you mean um or i guess where are you going with postmodernist or symbolic thinkers in, in what well, way here's, here's the thing right i think i think the the biggest divide i see between modernism and postmodernism is this the modernists simply don't see the world they see the world as a as a domain of things objects and facts let's mm -hmm. say so sure like you know wittgenstein's tractatus the world is facts as we see them, but then yes. the postmodernists, or, or even even the pre-Socratic thinkers understood that there was this well, uh, no, play, you know, Platonism. So there are that there are these. Well, even Platonism really wasn't. He wasn't talking about. Um, well, I haven't really read much Plato, so I don't really know. But I was going to really say, you, was, you're, you're going to be far more informed on anything having to do with Plato than I am, I promise. Yeah, because I don't know if he was talking about uh, symbols in the sense of they point towards something, or he was kind of saying, no, um, they, they actually are representations of the things in themselves. So they don't even, even point sure. towards something. Whereas uh, I'm assuming a you or even a Jonathan, uh, sorry, uh, Jonathan Peugeot would say, sure, yeah. Uh, it's pointing towards something, towards a, a deeper reality, let's say. So, mm -hmm. um, and and here's where I I do resonate with the postmodernists. So, do you, uh, Paul? I sent you that essay, uh, that article uh, by David. I can't pronounce his name. David Gangyong, where he was being quite critical uh, of Jordan Peterson, called uh, Jordan Peterson and the flaw of scientific inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, I gotta say, it's probably the first article that I've read that even though certainly David's no fan of Peterson at all. Uh, you, you can clearly see that he's got this deep contempt for him. Um, I thought he made some really good points, even in the domain of science where he was talking about uh, kind of kind of what you said, Paul, how do we choose where to go? So how does a scientist decide which science to mm -hmm. pursue? And then he spoke about uh, phrenesis and ep episteme. So Episteme is this kind of abstract theoretical science, and phrenesis involves 
uh, it's it's a term from Aristotle. I believe it means practical wisdom, to put it very very simply and colloquially. Sure. Uh, and the idea is, even in the scientific domain, the scientific domain itself, we like to think that it's just uh, the, the this this domain which has no perspectives, which is just prima facie. We observe the world, a world of facts, and then we come up with our theories and our conclusions. So, but the point he tries to make in the article is, even in this scientific domain, it is never detached from a perspective. Right. Or, or it's never filtered through, let's say, certain symbols, certain symbols we hold, certain um, essential symbols. And this is probably where there's a divide. The postmodernists would say that there's no essence to any of this. They're just symbolic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, yeah. see, for me, I find that rather contradictory because, OK, if there's no essence, then where do these symbols come from? Because they speak, they use a lot of symbolic language, uh, especially, especially the French intellectuals, you know, but then where do yeah, they? It's, all, it's almost do, all symbolic language. So yeah, how, make where, any sense where, ever. Where they, exactly. So how do we? How do they just come into their consciousness? And and then how do we even have a common conversation if there aren't there's there's right. in some kind of essence? Um, so, and, and I, I don't know. There really isn't. I'm not really putting forward a question here. I'm just try, trying to understand. Well, let me ask you this, Paul. How do you? How do you perceive? Like what? What's a symbol for you? To put it simply, sure, sure. Well, I, you know, there's it's um, is it semiotics? Is the field of like symbol versus sign versus index? You know, it's like yes, semiotics. a word and signifier, or like you know, a, like a sign is something that refers directly to um, something specific, something else, right? Like a stop sign refers to a specific action that you're supposed Correct. to take, or um, I believe like a picture of a rabbit is a sign of a, like the picture of a rabbit is, you know, a sign of a rabbit. It's not meant to, you know, mean anything else or something like that. But a symbol, and a symbol relates to archetypes. I think the way that I think about it is like, like, um, like, uh, like, like symbols coalesce around archetypes. So like, if you think about the archetype of anger, so anger, like an, you know, an archetype is a, is a fundamental pattern of behavior that that is, you know, wired within us, right? Um, you know, it, and it, it it's it's a fundamental pattern of behavior that is that exists independent of cultural conditioning. So anywhere you find humans, you will find these behaviors, right? And you know, symbolism symbols kind of they can never ca fully capture the essence of anger. This concept, right? Anger is something that I just have to assume that you, as a human being, you understand, right? Because I like. I can't, you know, it'd be like trying to describe color to a blind person if, 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 if you didn't experience anger the, the way I felt or suffering, right? Like if you didn't feel the experience of suffering, then we, you know, in some sense, we're not, we're not speaking the same language, right? We can't communicate at all. Um, and, you know, and symbols are, if, are, or even just artistic representations, or I, I believe it's um, representation collective East or something like that is, is Jung's term, but like, Symbols are are things that that speak to concepts that cannot be put that cannot be fully articulated ever, right? The, you know, the idea of pictures worth a thousand words. It's like, well, you know, the 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 god of Mars was the god of rage in the Roman Empire, right? And then I don't know if you've seen um, there's a movie called oh I think it's called Inside Out or it's a Disney movie. It's like a Disney Pixar movie right. with these little so these little many emotion people films. have recommended that movie to me. I, I've, I've got to watch it. It's Jungian, it's a Jungian archetypes, like in its purest, you know, oh, simplest form. It's the best. It's like that. I, I believe that's recommended that movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I do the same thing. When, okay, people when, like you that do recommend it. So yes, um, right. When, when I when I hear the same recommendation from three or four different people I trust, it's like okay, now I'm it, now I'm, now I'm doing yeah. it. Um, but in, inside, so you have the god of Mars, this ancient Roman sophisticated representation, the symbol, and then in Inside Out, it's this little furry ball that you know lives inside this you know little girl's brain. And it just, you know, it blows up and it gets mad when, you know, it, it like lights on fire when it's mad. It's a very simplistic representation. Both of those are symbolic of the same archetypal pattern of behavior that, that, you know, you can put into words, but ultimately you have to understand experientially, right? And so symbols, they coalesce around ideas that can't be put fully into words. Whereas like a sign, you know, again, a stop sign, you know, 
it, it conveys a specific action and you can map the sign directly onto the action. And, you know, anger is not necessarily an act. I mean, obviously there are actions associated with anger, but anger as such is a much more kind of amorphous, you know, complex um, idea. So it takes many forms. That, yeah. 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 That would be my semi, my pseudo semiotic explanation of, no, of that, that, that does. I think you did clear out the, something that I was struggling to articulate before, just, just, be, just before you said that, whereas for Plato, he he talked about mathematical objects. Also, in the Platonic realm, let's say it's yeah, again realm of the forms. Realm of the forms. It would just be an object, like a mathematical object. Whereas, and and it's the thing in itself. Yeah, like a chair. Whereas, like there's an essence yeah, of a chair, yeah, and then everything embodies chair. some degree of chairness or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And then then you know, then I do wonder. So like we speak about the symbols. And the symbols, as you put it quite well, point towards something. And then I think of this idea of, I've also been uh, trying to understand now uh, this idea of change and flow, as in, do we have an essence really? Because before Plato, there was Heraclitus who said that the only thing that was real was change. So uh, I think the, uh, not I think, I, I, I do remember the, I, I listened to a lecture on him. Um, an example that he used was, or the, the, an example that the lecturer used was, if you cross a river and you, you cross it a couple of times, is it the same river you're crossing? Yeah, you never step in the same river twice. I think that was Hegel, twice. I believe. And I, only because I think I just listened to a, uh, a discussion with a philosopher who's, who quoted that exact. You never step, you cannot step in the same river twice, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and, for me, it seems like, in that sense, symbolic symbolic thinking for me personally, uh, again, not, not trying to make any objective claims here, is probably more accurate than platonic thinking. Because mm. in, in symbolic thinking just points and says, look, there's something deeper here. There's something, there's something like a deeper reality, let's say. But we can never grasp it all because it's it takes many forms it's multivariate it's in in some sense constant flux and it even has no true essence even though it is set. right whereas yeah Plato would say no it has an essence it's 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 set it's mm -hmm. static and it's definable yeah and i think like like uh, the, I was gonna, two things both related to wittgenstein uh, game, the, the concept of a game, I think it fits in that perfectly. Uh, mm -hmm. Music is one example. I go to game as the other. It's like, what is a game? It's like, well, sit down and try and define a game and you'll never have a definition in which all things we consider games fall into that. You know, is peekaboo with a baby a game? Chess is a game. Hockey is a game. You know, uh, if you're flirting with someone, that's a game, right? It's yeah, like, totally. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so um, I think the platonic forms idea, I, I, I get it. It makes sense conceptually, but I think it's the problem with the platonic forms is, and I think Wittgenstein identified this is that, you know, like, like the essence of a chair, right? Like, well, you know, is a beanbag a chair is a stump a chair. It's like Wittgenstein kind of cut through that. And it was like, what's the purpose, right? It's all, it's all pragmatic. It's all, what is the, what is the, what is the purpose of even asking that question, right? This idea that we can get to these, like, you know, uh, defined answers of what a chair is and exactly to what degree do these objects all embody the essence of a chair. It's like, what, why, why, Wittgenstein would say, well, why even ask that question, right? It's all about what you're trying to achieve. And that's, to me, that's a very prag pragmatic view in the spirit of William James, right? The, um, which Jordan Peterson certainly embodies to, to a significant degree. Um, and that sort of undercuts this, this, this idea, well, there's these platonic forms um, and, and the different things embody it. Although there's a lot of overlap that is interesting um, that needs to be sussed out, certainly on my end, of like archetypes versus forms, right? Because like, well, what's an archetype versus what's a, isn't an archetype kind of a platonic form in some sense? Yeah. And I think the difference between an archetype and a form is like, a, like a form, like we were saying, there's a, there's a chair, it's like an object, right? A mathematical object. An archetype is not an object. An archetype is a, is a, is a it's a pattern of behavior is the best way to think about. It. It's a, 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 a um, and, and Jung even identified it as like a, empirical or biological concept in that you know it's like i think the example he gave was you know like de describing something as an archetype is like describing something as an arthropod like an arthropod is something that has a specific set of features right and an archetype depending on which archetype you're talking about um 
or just being in the realm of archetypes is like in a, you know like falling in love or being angry you know or, or or death and rebirth it's like they have specific qualities associated with it but it's not like an object right rebirth is not an object love is not an object so you know like the synthesis i i think maybe you could say between the platonic forms and the archetypes is you know there are no mathematical objects as such but there but there are there are like fundamental essences in terms of behavior right and maybe you know like music is one of them like does music not exist it's like that's a stupid question right like obviously music exists right now if you're a postmodernist you say well no it doesn't really exist what what you describe what you decide as what what you call music is merely the result of your you know social conditioning and it's like well no, because you can get tribes that have completely independent of one another across the world, across time. And they all come up with, they all converge independently on these, at least, you know, rudimentary musical ideas, you know, beat rhythm and, you know, circle of fits and all this stuff, although it varies a lot. Um, but yeah, I've, that, that, I remember watching a lecture where Peterson brought up that platonic forms were a form of archetype or something like that. And that's been an interesting area, um, you know, for me to think about. Yeah, because I'm thinking, you know, uh, kind of, I think Foucault in, in Structure of Knowledge, this is what he's trying to get at, where he, he says, uh, how do we, so we all view the world in a certain way. We have certain presuppositions that we, that we hold on to right now. Who tell, who, are, are those, do we come at those presuppositions through fiat to like, let's say the, to like a Plato or like a, a Kant, some, some, something that a, a, mm. a certain philosopher just declared by fiat. So Plato would say, oh, there's a, there are platonic forms, there's an essence to things, you know, Kant would talk about transcendental idealism or, or whatever that is. And then that, that idea, it's, it's so potent, it's so powerful that it completely influences how all of us think right now through, well, for him. Plato's case, two thousand over two thousand years later, and in Kant's case, almost four hundred years later. So, and and that's what I'm, I'm trying to get at. Like maybe maybe what symbolic language in that sense does is it it constantly updates our thought models and and not I don't know if thought models because that that reduces it to kind of like an algorithm or some kind of computer program. I'm, sure. I'm not even trying to reduce it to that level, yeah, like computational but, thinking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm not even trying to say it's computational thinking at at all. But it seems like uh, okay. I, I'll put I'll put it this way, Paul. Uh, and forgive me if I'm not. You know, I'm trying. To, I haven't worked out this idea yet. I'm kind of working oh, it out right now. Yeah. So. I cl clearly I haven't either so far. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. So forgive me if I'm very very <laughs> ineloquent no at this. So okay, Kuhn talks about the the paradigms of uh, scientific revolutions, right? So we have different uh, paradigms in, in history of science. Right. Paradigm shift. Yeah. Paradigm shift. Terminology. Yeah, I'm wondering if we're going through one right now in this, mm. uh, right? Like we're living through it right now because especially- a scientific if, paradigm shift or, or what kind of paradigm shift? Oh, I, I, I certainly think a scientific par paradigm shift for sure because now a lot of modern science probably is starting to take uh, consciousness a lot more seriously. Yeah. But not, not in the sense of, the way a cognitivist would with uh you know again thinking computationally probably not in that sense but trying to map it with the works of let's say a paul uh sorry a carl i almost said paul you <laughs> a carl uh -huh. you uh or even like a paul tillich uh who's one probably my my favorite christian existentialist like he influenced my thinking a lot who also okay. speaks in symbolic what's thinking. his name a paul tillich uh paul tillich yeah. okay yeah a really good book called the courage to be and, okay. and also really i think my favorite book of his is the dynamics of faith brilliant brilliant book okay. highly recommend it um so like all, all these different thinkers who you wouldn't think are in the established scientific orthodoxy so to speak and they're, they're trying to bring them all in and create this amalgamation and i don't know if in some sense why we both or at least i am confused just because we're going through this paradigm shift i'm also confused don't worry and yes. and and here's where i think what the postmodernists say has some value because see peterson says and he has said this explicitly that the postmodernists he agrees that context matters that we've got a problem of context and interpretation 
but I'm number even, of interpretations, right? Exactly. Yeah. But I'm going even one step further and saying maybe they have a point in saying that when they say there's no essence, they aren't saying there's no objective truth or nothing exists in like the Sartrean sense, but rather that the, the essence itself isn't a static thing. It's a it's a forever changing dynamic thing. And and humanity, let's use a union term, our collective unconscious, we, we, we keep updating it and redefining it. Yeah. So, so it's a kind of like an Eastern philosophical idea. Um, and I can, I don't know if that's why, if that's where, uh, you know, it gets, it, it, it seeps its head into the political domain with the whole gender thing or even mm, questioning, sure. questioning very fundamental things like freedom of speech. Um, right or individual sovereignty or, or things like that yeah well um just d- d- a couple of thoughts come to mind so you know to, on the point about paradigm paradigm shifts it's like and symbolic thinking you know and i am by no means even remotely capable of comprehending any of this i don't think anyone is but like you know when you get in the realm of quantum physics right and you get in the realm of okay well people you know there's, you know, there's an increasing consensus that what there are multiple universes or that, you know, there, are, you know, I, I can't even like, I can't even begin to explain it, you know, in, 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 a, in a cohesive way. But um, when I listen to, you know, theoretical physicists talk about things, like, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, increasingly, you know, we've, there's multiple universes or something like that. It's like, that is symbolic thinking, right? Even the concept of infinity is a symbol. It's a mm. metaphorical concept because infinity is, you can't, you, how could you conceptual or how can you, how, how can infinity objectively exist, right? Like, you know, it's like, you know, the universe is, is expanding. It's like expanding into what? It's like, so what's outside of the universe? Is that objective or not? It's like, it, even these terms are, are, are metaphorical, right? Multiple universes. Yeah. It's so unintuitive, right? I would go one step further and even say universe itself is a symbolic metaphor. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Symbolic tone. You know, I mean, he- yes. I think Heidegger made this, dis- dis- made this distinction where in being in time, he says the world and then he, then he has a universe. So the universe for him is this abstract thing. It's not, it's not a thing that we can, it's not a palpable thing for us, really. Yeah. Because the world is the world of objects, world of tools. Right. And so like when, when you and I, and I would even say a scientist, just talk about and use the term universe, it seems symbolic in some sense. Yes. Yes, definitely. And so that, you know, so that paradigm shift is like, well, and to your point about consciousness, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, idea of panpsychism. Oh, so yeah. yeah, yeah. Con- so the consciousness is a fundamental there. constituent of reality. Yeah, I, I don't know the implications of that. I don't. I haven't gone into a detail. I do know that Sam Harris, who again I kind of think of as the pure materialist, rationalist kind of person, you know, he is. T- he seems from the podcast I've listened to, sympathetic or at least open to that kind of worldview. That you know that that the fundamental constituents of conscious experience exist like in atoms, right? You know, in, in some way. I don't really understand it fully. Um, or even at all, maybe. Um, but like to me, okay, that that's a paradigm shift where you know we've redefined. If if consciousness is something that can be you know it exists in fundamental constituent form in atoms, well now we're not talking about consciousness anymore, right? That's a paradigm shift. Whereas consciousness was this consciousness is this you know this locus of experience, right, and locus of being or whatever. But an atom doesn't have that, and yet somehow it contributes to that or it, it you know when it organizes it produces something greater than it's than it's you know organizational structure or something it's like yeah that that's a paradigm shift that is also we're reshifting our symbolic language from consciousness which is clearly a symbolic metaphor right possible to possibly define to something that is well distributed into the material world it's like okay well now now we've just taken the, the realm of the symbolic and infused it into the objective reality right it's like yeah. So yeah, you know, and it gets confusing and, and all that, but it's 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 interesting because as we continue to progress through, you know, scientific advancements, whether or not AI is conscious and all that, it's like it, it poses all these challenges to how we think about these things. Yeah, because you know that observation you made about consciousness and the like, well, the panpsychist idea, but something that couples onto that is something I recently read an essay by Bertrand Russell where he says. The complicated question isn't what's consciousness. We know he for him, 
consciousness is quite obvious because we are conscious beings. Yeah. He says that the uh, complicated question is what's matter. We have no idea what matter is. Sure. Like what is it? What is an atom? Right. And, and and I think he's got a point because how, how do how does a how does a so-called physical world and this is a problem Kant was struggling with really uh, in which is why he wrote the critique of pure reason. How does the physical world, which is governed by causality, imbue conscious beings that have freedom, that that have free will? Right. Uh, or at least the where, illusion of free will, because, you know, Sam Harris would dispute all that. Correct. Yeah. I mean, for, I mean, Kant certainly were very, he was like a free will dogmatist. He really believed right. in it. Uh, sure. oh, oh, yeah. Maybe even the illusion of free will. But at least, again, let's get let's get a bit more pragmatic at least we think we're free right we, we think right we're right free. right it's it's kind of it's it doesn't make any sense to conceptualize it any other way which yeah. goes back to that kind of william james idea of truth is like well we act as if free will exists and to and if we don't act like free will exists well i don't even know how you would do that so yeah. it's kind of like does it exist it's like yeah. yeah yeah you know it's interesting isn't it like uh you know you made the video about wash i've got a couple of your videos here paul hmm. i'm not going to talk about the wash video because this conversation is a lot more interesting for me personally <laughs> yes uh, no uh, i'm gonna i'm probably gonna i'm probably gonna move to the video you made called uh i'll link all these videos down below the description sure postmodernism and the re-emergence of mass psychosis yeah. uh, I've, i had a few questions on that um yeah. but just yeah. just to a little bit of an ancillary point on the wash video you, you did you did talk about like how intellectuals you know or generally people who are very good at abstract thinking uh, can can conjure up anything in their mind right it, it can be virtually anything but yes it, my favorite line is intelligent people are very good at rationalizing stupid ideas and the more intelligent <laughs> you are the stupider yeah, yeah, the idea yeah, you're yeah, capable yeah, of yeah yeah and and you know, it's, it's kind of good because that also gives way to creative thinking because we need to be able to conjure up anything in our mind to yeah. start somewhere. Uh, but dub double-edged sword, definitely double-edged sword. Um, right. So Paul, in your video, Postmodernism and the Re-Emergence of Mass Psychosis, which was brilliantly done, by the way, uh, you, you edit your videos quite well. Um, Appreciate I, it. I got to say. Um, so look, I'm going to ask you very, just blatantly, what's yeah. wrong with postmodernism? Mm. Well, like you said earlier, uh, they get some things right. You know, postmodernism is the belief that um, there there is no overarching, coherent me meta narrative. Right? There's no single philosophy that encapsulates the totality of the human experience. Which, like on the face of it, I kind of agree with. Right? You know, we can't how, mathematical philosophy. You, when you get into quantum physics, we're talking about multi multiple universes. It's like, you know, that seems so detached that I I, I, I get that. Um, in a purely practical sense, and that, that video was about the practical um, implications, the negative implications of postmodernism. You know, the idea that, okay, there is no natural essence to anything. All, all definitions are social constructs that are put in place by those people who have power. And even the very language we use is a means of reinforcing the, the people who created the language, you know, their power. And I get that idea. So like, um, you know, like uh, in medieval times, Christianity and the focus on the afterlife, heaven, by right, the concept of heaven, you could argue was a means for those people in the church to maintain their power because, hey, instead of you peasants focusing on improving your own life in the material world, just, you know, do right by each other and then you'll go to heaven. You don't have to worry about it. And oh, we, by the way, get to keep all your money and taxes and all that, right? It's like, okay, that makes sense. The problem with the postmodern perspective is that when you say, okay, like male and female, those are, those are scientific categories that are social constructs because science is done by um, people and people are subject to these power games. And then specifically they would say, you know, Western science is a, you know, Western white supremacist construction and therefore scientific categories. The, the act of categorizing what we would call male or female is in and of itself unethical to some degree or marginalizing or whatever. And it's like, well, sure. But back to the pragmatic point, it's like, are there pragmatic distinctions between, you know, mo people who are male and female? It's like, obviously, right, from a reproduction standpoint, 
but then from a you know sports perspective or from a prison perspective right we separate you know men and women um you know males and females for practical reasons and just because okay well those categories admits of exceptions and if we say well you're male or female well what about intersex people and look how difficult we're making their lives by using these terms it's like there is no definition that does not that is not that is 100 perfect right that gets into the mathematical objects and platonic forms right it's like so at, if we're being pragmatic if we're trying to act in the world we're going to use language that's inherently imprecise there's no way around that and the postmodernists would say that because language is imprecise and socially constructed um we should we should we should change it uh whenever we see that there is utility in doing so and i partly agree with it but like the postmodernists, at least in the modern sense, who say that gender is completely, you know, me meaningless and sex is, is not, you know, these are all made up terms and, you know, you're, you're assigned a sex at birth rather than observed a sex at birth. It's like, well, what are the implications of that? Okay, well, we have males in female prisons and, you know, there's been numerous incidents of sexual assault and you have children who are at 13 undergoing medical procedures irreversible medical procedures because they have this you know concept of a gender identity which is this ephemeral idea and even though that's ephemeral we still need to do heart you know objective medical interventions to align with this more abstract idea and it's like there's there's inconsistency and there's 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 just like contempt i would say because oh well any definition that hitherto was has been used is the result of power dynamics and we're revolution we're fighting back against it it's like okay well even that act of saying well we want to break out of gender norms it's like well why do you want to break out of gender norms because you believe in equality you believe in the right to every person that live a dignified life it's like okay that idea arguably is it just as a is a western idea or at least a, you know originated in the western canon Judy as well as other places yeah, coming along from there right right yeah exactly so it's like yeah, from a purely practical view, this idea that you can just, you know, deconstruct everything and that all, all definitions are inherently um, constraining, which they are, but therefore should be challenged at all times by those on the margins. It's like, well, then you end up with males and female prisons. And, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't, care. maybe I shouldn't care about that because I don't have any personal connection to that. But it's like, well, I have no problem saying, you know, I, I try my best to speak what I believe is true and what I believe is good. And, you know, putting male sex offenders in female prisons for the sake of equality or whatever, I think is nonsense. And so, you know, this goes back to the idea of like, we're not, mo when I make a video like that, I'm not just exploring an idea, right? I am ma I'm making a stance, right? Cause I, you know, I'm not, it's, you know I don't think I'm smart enough to be, you know, here exploring ideas and in, 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 you know, it just without limits, it's like, you know, in some sense, to some degree I am, but in, in a more fundamental sense, it's like, I am trying to make a positive impact and that's why I do what I do. And so when I criticize postmodernism and its implications in, you know, society, it's like that, you know, that's, that's an intellectual critique, but it's as much of a moral critique, you know? Um, so yes, if that answers your question to any degree. Oh, no, it certainly does. And I got to say uh, about the gender thing, what's interesting about that is that, you know, I think we all need to come to, I'm making a very all-encompassing, totalizing claim here, but sure. I, I do believe there's some kind of truth in this. I think we all need to come at peace with the, the verity that reality is essentially, this is chaotic nature to reality. And that we can never truly escape that. Right. You know, the only and part of the mean, thing is change, right? That's mm, what we mentioned. Yeah, earlier. things change. And, and what I mean by that is, Paul, this is me just speaking purely personally. I've had moments, you know, so I'm, I've even, uh, it's interesting. Okay. I, I think I've got a lot of feminine uh, characteristics. Yeah, My favorite same. book, for example, is Pride and Prejudice. Who you you think Jane Austen would be <laughs> something that. Uh, My favorite well. TV show is uh, Friends. So, there you go, I'm, man. I mean, I love yes. the notebook, you know, like, the, the, but does yeah, that yeah. mean I'm a woman? Th that doesn't mean right. I'm a woman, you know, I mean, right. oh, may maybe it does, who knows? Like, but what, what I'm trying to say is that it's, 
which is kind of why I guess I am quite in some way, uh, I see I have some kind of affinity with the French intellectuals because they do point at these contradictions of living. So Camus is sure. one of the best examples. Uh, he in, in most of his work, he just talks about absurdism, right? So Kafka and Camus, they talk yeah. about our contradictions in living. And I wonder, I wonder if what's going on right now is because we're coming to this realization that there is this chaotic nature. It isn't all chaos, certainly not, because for me, that's a, that's like a, a lazy way to escape being just saying sure. everything is chaotic. It's a cynical. Yeah. N- nothing matters. Yeah. Nothing matters. Everything's chaotic. Uh, for me, I, I, I would, I'm certainly not saying that. And personally, I detest individuals who say that for me, Same. it's just that that's intellectually lazy, but, but, but it's also, intellectually lazy or even arrogant to say that okay i'm, I'm sorry I'm, I'm going everywhere with this you made a no. good video on charlie kirk mate which i thought was personally uh, in my opinion was your best video wow, because you okay, said the, the way that you know by fiat he says no it's true it, it, it certainly is true yeah and it's the ideal that yeah. kind of hubris i can't i right. mean personally man I, I i don't i can't live like that like i when mm. i even say something is true I want to pull those words words back in my mouth because I have no bloody fucking idea, you know, and, and, and that's where I think I'm trying to get at where I'm trying to understand, huh? Well, maybe there is this chaotic nature to reality that we need to, I I wouldn't even say come at peace with, but maybe integrate it into our living and understand that. Yes. I, I, there isn't, you know, there is never greener pastures. There isn't even, there is never this place of where you can settle and say, Ah, finally, I'm I'm, I'm right. here. I, I found some 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 solid ground. Maybe one never finds it, and we just sure. have to live through it. All right, it's um, the journey, not the destination. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, I know that's a cliche, but I think that is so true, man. And I, I can't, well, uh, that cliches tend to be like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because think about it, right? Like if if that wasn't there, you and I probably wouldn't be having this conversation, right? What you're right. And what, why not? What's what, why, why even get out of bed? You know, exactly. Satisfy basic drives. Right. Yeah. And, and, and look, personally, I'm finding this deeply meaningful and that meaning that I'm finding in this moment, wouldn't, it wouldn't appear if that a journey wasn't there or if I was already right. at the destination in some sense. Um, so and he, that leads, leads me to the other question, Paul. So in the same video you did, I think it was in that video, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've spoken about this in a couple of your other videos, sure. where you do bring up this, look at the social, uh, look at the ramification, the social ramifications of these postmodern abstract intellectual ideas. You know, yeah. the, the whole gender thing is certainly the most conspicuous one. And I'm just, here's what I was thinking. I had this thought. I've been struggling with this for a couple of months. Uh, uh, what if truth or the the reality of the world, whatever that means, it actually was nihilistic and detrimental to being human? What if truth was just, what if truth was the devil? You know, what, what if truth was that well, everything is chaotic, there's no... Right objective morality there's no good or evil um yeah and I, I i don't i haven't got an answer to this so i'm just gonna ask from you like how would you respond to that if that, yeah. that was the case yeah I i'm had not the, saying uh, i'm not saying that's the case but if that sure the yeah case. yeah no i and i had the same i was thinking about that specifically actually um a week a week or two ago or something yeah what it, like what if it is the case that yeah pursuit of truth is actually like tr- is bad you know th- the truth is not good in and of itself it's like yeah, it's harmful to us to our to our being right and, and and you can clearly you can easily think of examples where that is the case it's like well you know you know what you don't know doesn't hurt you it's like to some degree that's true right like if i mean you could just think of any simple example like you know you you know you're, you 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 know let's say you worked at a company for 5 years and all your coworkers hated you but you never knew that and you were really successful at the job and then you got a new job where everyone loves you. It's like, did it really matter then that, you know, at the time or whatever, it's like, you can, you can think of examples where, where that's the case, but like, to, you know, to take it to its logical extreme. This is why I think the pragmatist worldview is so valuable and useful is what like the, the, the I've said the only objective truth, the only single objective fact that is indisputable and, and 
good, maybe a separate thing, but it's indisputable is that suffering is bad. The experience of suffering is bad. And I don't mean physical pain per se, because obviously, you, you know, when you're working out, it, it hurts. Um, I did a minute plank today and that was like painful as hell. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, slowly but, suffering. You know, yeah, right, right. And, agony. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Hell is just an endless plank. Um, but like, and, you know, suffering makes you stronger, right? But like, like, like needless suffering is, is Peterson's term. And that, you know, that gets subjective, whatever. But like, this goes back to this, I, I cut through the rationalization by just appealing to experiences. Like every person knows that their own personal suffering is not, is something that you don't want to experience, right? Mm. You, you, you'll experience it in the moment for, you know, for something greater, but even that implies that the suffering you're experiencing now will pay off in a reduction of suffering later, like right? So even, yeah, right, exactly. So, so, you know, like, like, having your entire world fall apart, you know, your, your, you know, your, your family, your friends, your society, all of that falling apart to like, to say that that's a good thing is like, I'm just like, I, I, I be, if someone said they believe that I would take it the same way as if they said, well, if I put my hand on a hot stove for no reason and just put it there, that's a good thing. It's like, I don't believe you unless of course, unless you're a, a Buddhist monk and you're doing that with the attempt of trying to overcome you know, some lim physical limitation or something like that. But again, that goes back to the, they're doing it for the purpose of re reducing suffering in another sense, right? Because they're, they're being driven to some, um, you know, better outcome. And so the pragmatist conception of truth is that, you know, it's, it, it's true. And I, which I think overlaps with Wittgenstein. And I haven't heard Peterson reference Wittgenstein much, but I, I, I have to believe there's overlap there, whether it was William James influencing Wittgenstein. I think he talks um, about Wittgenstein in his book, uh, Maps of Meaning. I recall okay. he did. Okay. Yes. Yes. Times. Yeah. And so that, you know, the concept is like, well, what are you trying to achieve? It's like, well, my ultimate goal is I want to reduce the amount of suffering that I experience in life. And that, that a pure nihilist can agree with that. Well, life has no meaning. Life has no meaning. Life has no meaning. It's all pointless. It's like, well, not being, not suffering any more than you have to is a goal that every person by virtue of the fact that you're a person wants to pursue. And so in, in that sense, like truth can't be can't be ultimately evil if it achieves that goal of moving you away from suffering. And certainly, you know, if, if, if anyone has ever moved away from suffering by doing anything, like you, you understand what that means intuitively, right? But well, what if logically, you know, we're in a simulation and it, it's just being run by, you know, an evil God that's just torturing us. It's like, well, again, from a pragmatic perspective, it's like, well, as of this moment in the simulation, there are things I can do to reduce my suffering. And maybe when we all die, we all burn in hell forever and there's no escape. It's like, well, maybe there's no way to prove that, but whether or not that's true, I'm going to act the same way in reducing my suffering in the current moment, right? So that pragmatism has been over the last like three or two, two to three years for me has been, at least my understanding of pragmatism has been one of the most valuable tools for kind of getting out of those, those existential pits, I would say. You know, I'm surprised, Paul, uh, that you say that you didn't resonate with Nietzsche because a lot of what Nietzsche writes is well, exactly I, and the point you're making where he says there's no... So he's very critical of religion, obviously, and he says mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's no use talking about the afterlife. Focus on this yeah. life right now. He's right. a very... He's affirm yourself in this life and live passionately, chaotically, um, and, and also in genealogy of morals, which probably is... For me, his my his my, my favorite book of his. Sure. The idea is that forget about objective morality, forget about all these high and mighty, all encompassing concepts. Focus on what's at what's at hand right now, like one's palpable experience. And that sounds a lot like what you're saying with the pragmatism. Correct me yes. if I'm wrong. Or... Yes, I think so. Yeah. And I, and I and I would and I would say it's not that I didn't resonate with Nietzsche. It's that I simply could not understand him when I was reading him. But the but you know P, you know P, Peterson was hugely influenced by Nietzsche, and so that 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 filters through his work. Um, but yeah, you know, like I like I'm not I'm not I'm not religious in the traditional colloquial sense, in that I believe that I'm going to heaven or hell. Um, I'm I'm I remain completely agnostic in terms of what comes after death. Um, but like, yeah, you know, but li you know, live your, your, you are a living being here. You are here. You exist. What are you going to do? You're going to sit there and, and, 
and, you know, rationalize your way into an existential depression. It's like, I have done that, you know, going back to the very beginning, you know, that's where a lot of the yeah. mental health issues I was having is like, well, what meaning is just this bullshit thing I make up and it's all pointless. So who, you know, why even exist anymore? It's like, I completely understand that having been, you know, having been convinced by that for a, a lengthy period of time. Um, but the, but again, it's like, well, what am I going to do? Right. What do I, do I want, do I want to remain in this existential depression or do I want to get out of it? And you could say, well, your desire to get out of this existential, you know, if reality is truly meaningless, your desire to get out of that is just a rationalization you make and reality is still meaningless. It's like, again, put your hand on a burning stove and you'll understand meaning very quickly. Then, you know, get, you immediately take it back. Right. And it's like, to me, that's very powerful. And that, yeah. that's putting your hand on the stove is the analogy Sam Harris uses, which, so I think Sam Harris and Peterson are both grounded in a pragmatist framework. I think Peterson would say yeah. the same thing. And Sam Harris, I think, would implicitly agree. It's just they differentiate you know, on, you know, yeah. how necessary is religion in, in that whole calculation. You know, Paul, uh, I'm, I'm just going to, I mean, you seem like a sincere guy, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be upfront with you. Sure. You, said, you said that when you had your mental health issues and your, uh, can I call it depression? Yeah, um, yeah. That it yeah. was, that you sort of, rationalized your way into it right i think i'm doing that i'm in my life right now i'm i'm doing mm. that to myself where i'm sure sort of trying to overtly intellectualize everything and that's leading me towards this sense of meaninglessness or nihilism but but i think the reason that 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 it's not happening is also because i i, I don't know man i'm just grateful and and my, my nature is to love life so my my passions are saving me from my mm. reason so to speak yes like sure. i can't yeah. i can't not for example this uh, like last uh on friday i caught up with a few mates uh and we were just getting some beers and we were at this bar called uh, naked for satan here in melbourne <laughs> this is a church of nihilism yeah yeah yeah, sure. yeah. It, it was called naked satan but like good food and at that moment and i know it's such a a vain superficial way to describe it but for me i i that makes me fall in love with the world you know and i can think of like my family or or, or my, my, my parents or whoever i mean i grew up in uh, sri lanka so i'm i was born and raised in sri lanka i'm a migrant here sure. And okay. I think of how fortunate I am to be in Australia, which is a beautiful country. I love this country. So, and all of those things aren't necessarily uh, reason-based things. They're just yeah, of course. in my nature to like, fall in love with it. And then when I get into my intellectual work, I want to get into like reading philosophy or, or, or postmodernist, which I've been trying to read a lot these days. Mm -hmm. it, it is leading me towards this sense of, uh, it's not really a negative view of the world but rather this es essenceless uh nihilistic view of the world yeah yeah uh, and I, I don't know i mean what would your advice be do you think i should stop doing yeah. that or, or well well the, so so i so i went to therapy for for nine months and the, the single biggest takeaway that i learned was that there is a difference between thoughts and feelings so for example, I had a friend that was being an asshole to me and anytime we'd, you know, be hanging out and he'd be, you know, say some fucking provocative bullshit or something like that, um, or insulting thing, I, I would go, okay, well, he, you know, I, I knew I, I, he's, he's my friend and I knew he was dealing with some issues. So I would think I'd go, oh, well, the reason he's being a, a jerk right now is because he's, he's got his own issues and he's projecting. And, you know, maybe I'm having a good time and he sees that and he's, you know, a piss or whatever. And then he tries to bring me down or something like that. That's all intellectualized. I'm coming up with the reasons for his behavior, right? Whereas, and so I would go into therapy and I would say that. And so my therapist would say, Paul, how do you feel about your friend being an asshole to you? I'm like, well, I think he's this. I think he's going through issues. And he goes, Paul, I didn't ask you what you think. I asked you how you felt. <laughs> and he had to demonstrate for me what that meant. Like, Paul, thinking is what you're doing. You're coming up with reasons. A saying how you feel is like saying, uh, it feels like shit. It fucking sucks. It sucks that I'm over with my friend. We're playing a board game and he accuses me of cheating or something like that. I'm like, you, you think I'm going to cheat playing a fucking board game? Well, I'm, I'm going to punch the guy on the face, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's a Many feeling, times I've had right? that feeling. Yeah. 
right and so that i and on the way home from that session i was literally laughing for like 10 minutes i was just like chuckling like oh my god it's like so obvious um and you know that like that my relationship to what i talk about in my videos or my philosophy whatever you know it is it, it, it draws from my personal experiences, that one in particular about this idea of like, well, I could think all I want about this or that and come up with reasons or whatever. But like, I'm a human, so I still have to feel. And, mm -hmm. and for me to spend so much time thinking about well, what do I think about this versus how do I feel about this? And again, rationality is subservient to feelings. Thoughts are subservient to feelings, right? And so, you know, you ask like, you know, what advice would I give? It's like, well, I, you know, I think you are someone who's, you and I are probably both very high in openness and oh, therefore, suddenly. you know, Right. And so we are naturally inclined to pursue, you know, these ideas or whatever, um, and, you know, and, and I, we kind of owe it. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I, yeah, yeah. Add, I think you and I, we can't settle on an idea. Like yeah. We oh, of course. We have to right. go on. Yes. Until, until the fundamental nature of reality is in my grasp, I won't be settling. But yeah. even so, we'll be like, oh, no, this probably isn't fundamental. There's something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Once you get there, I'm like, mm, yeah, people, no, it's that's something I'm noticing because all my, all my friends also are high in openness because, you know, sure. like we're like minded in that sense and we yes. never settle. We just keep. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So, right. So, no, no, no. So, like when, you know, when you're pursuing, and I'm saying this to you as much as myself. You know, when you're pursuing ideas that are uh, dangerous in some sense, not, not dangerous and that you shouldn't pursue them, but like, you know, dangerous and that they have significant implications for how you live your life. Like, you know, you have to embrace that, but recognize that like, you can think about ideas all you want and you can think and commit to them and say, well, this one's right and this one's wrong, but you have to embody them in order for them to have any value, right? Or, or, you know, you ultimately have to embody, if you think an idea is correct, you know, if you believe an idea, you in principle should embody it, right? So, um, and at, as soon as you get into the embodiment, you're in the realm of feelings. So it's like, well, does life, you know, life has, no, you know, there's an infinite number of interpretations and like, you know, who's to say that, you know, gender is, is or male and female are, are, you know, there really are, there's variations and they're not fixed categories and all this. And it's, it's like, Okay, well, what does that mean? Again, it's like, well, you know, you know, for me, like the feelings are, it's like, okay, well, you know, I'll I'll go on the detransition subreddit and I'll read the story of some kid who's having a panic attack because he, you know, got all the surgery and now his life is permanently ruined. It's like, well, as someone who has, you know, dealt with panic attacks, I, I it's not a matter of, well, I think that this idea that gender is completely malleable and thirteen-year-olds can get surgery, like it might be right. It's like, no now I'm in the realm of feeling, I know this is wrong. You know, it, it, I, I know it's, I know it's, I know it's wrong to, you know, I know it's wrong to promote it as if it's a universal truth, right? I don't know how universal, you know, there's some, there are some kids who, when they were 13, could get surgery and have been fine. But there are many, I believe, many more who would be confused and it would ruin their life. So, you know, this idea that, well, now we need to make it accessible for everyone all the time. Like I'm against that from a feelings perspective as, you know, as well as a thought perspective, um, which e even I just noticed, you know, even in that, in me explaining that to you, I kind of divorced it from my own experience and kind of moved it into this realm of like what I talk about on YouTube or whatnot, but like. No, but that is also what you do, isn't it? Paul? Like it's, it's okay because, you know, the, the YouTube channel, it's a part of you. This, what I'm right. doing right now is a part of us. So yeah, yeah. I don't think we both are trying to overtly abstract it out or right. intellectualize it because if not, if, if we don't, you know, talk about the things that we spend our time doing, then what's there to talk about? Exactly, really? exactly, <laughs> exactly. Right. And it's very, it's very, I've had conversations with people and, you know, where like, they just want to talk about the ideas or whatnot, like, like Christian apologists, um, like I've been in a discord um, and had some conversations and, it, you know, like I would ask like, well, like how do you, like, how has this impacted your life? Or do you really believe this? Like I'm asking you the person it's like, look, the ideas are, I'm just talking about the ideas. Like just think about logically you're, you're appealing to, um, you know, they, they, they like, they formalize all their arguments and like, well, that's an appeal to theology. Yeah. 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 And it's like, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Like you want to talk about religion and God. It's like, we're talking about spiritual experiences and if you want to reduce that to just logic and reasoning it's like well then you lost me at the beginning and i just don't believe you if you're if you 
well, you know, God is real independent of any of this experience. It's just real if you just, you know, follow the logic. It's like, well. That makes you've, even more sense to me. For me, in fact, for me, even the word real, when people say something is real, independent of experience, I still can't, honestly, I still can't fathom what that means. Yeah. Like, I sure. don't know what, when, when someone makes that claim, what that means, especially something that's, uh, let's say, phenomenological like God. You know, which is, it's not like saying this pen is real, detached yeah. from my experience or... Um, Hey, Paul, we've gone for over an hour and a half. And, mate, thank, yeah. thank you so much for the advice. I, I appreciate yes. that. I The reason I asked was because when you put it that way, instantly, just in the back of my mind, I was like, this is mm. what I'm doing to myself right now. Yeah, sure, sure. And I just wanted to know, you know, what advice you would have. Um, yeah, definitely. It is, yeah, it is, it's it's funny, right? Like, I, I feel like sometimes we fall in love with our own suffering, where See, me even talking about this, it feels to me like a vain act because I do know that the reason I'm doing this is because there's something romantic about it. So it's it's vanity in its in a peculiar form. Yeah. I do right. know that, you know, saying, oh, life is meaningless, life, life is nihilistic, there's like a poetic, romantic, uh, almost seductive there's freedom in that. Yeah. It, there's sure. like, yeah, exactly, a very seductive sort of freedom. But I think it's useless and I think it's vain and I think it's uh, it's rather, yeah, so sometimes rather narcissistic. Uh, right. Sometimes. Well, and I, I was talking to someone and it's like, this guy was a pure nihilist, life is no meaning, life is no meaning. So I asked him like, okay, if you had a friend who was just doing drugs and like ruining their life basically, but they really enjoyed the drugs, like, would you advise against that? He's like, no, you know, like people can do what they want. It's like, okay, well, my only argument against that, this is not an intellectual one, but it's like, I would never want to be your friend and I feel bad for all your friends. Yeah. Right. And it's like, well, well, that's not a real argument. It's like, mm, well, I operate in the real world where my words are not disembodied thoughts. It's like, my words are extensions of my behavior. And it's like, well, to the degree, to the, to the best degree I can, um, you know, manage, but, um, yeah, you know, our, yeah. Our, our mutual friend, Kyle, he talks a lot about yeah, yeah. John Novakey and because of mm, him, yes. I've been looking into a lot of uh, watching a lot of, John Reiki's videos and even I, I I downloaded some of his papers but they're like 30 pages long mate so I gotta sure. find the time yeah to read them. yeah I, I watched uh, it, and he uh, makes the, first... the exact point John Reiki yeah. yeah I watched the first couple lectures of his I think it's awakening from the meaning crisis and he finds, oh, brilliant. yeah and he, he had yeah and I think oh, it was the second episode brilliant. he's got a great he has a great I would say trans at least for me was a transformative lecture where he talked about the pervasiveness of metaphor going back to this kind of symbolic thinking how every word that you and i utter in and and it, this is true for every language is ultimately based in metaphor like do you, like do you see what i'm saying well do you see what i'm saying like that's a that's a metaphor for that right like metaphors fill our language okay well fill is a metaphor right do you, you know understanding all these even all these words are, and you trace down like the latin roots to everything it's all they're all they're all uh, action or visuospatial concepts, right? And this idea that it all builds from there connects with this idea that we're embodied first and rationality grows out of it. Then you couple it with Jordan Peterson's, well, not Jordan Peterson's point, but just the fact that our prefrontal cortex grew out of our mo motor cortex, which means that we first had to be able to act before we could grow the part of our brain that allowed us to conceptualize how to act. And, you know, the way that the neurology is structured where the, the thickness of the neural pathways projecting into our prefrontal cortex is far more than the pathways that go from our prefrontal cortex to our emotions or to our more limbic um, parts of our brain, which is the emotional parts of our brain having to do with action. Well, that's just another example that rationality is a slave to the passions. You know, it's like you, you see it in all these different domains and it all lines up. And then this, this, this grand narrative, this meta narrative starts to appear. And then, you know, you just keep adding pieces to that. And then, oh, it turns out I was wrong about this. And so I break off this piece and I reformulate it. And you have this sort of kind of cohesive worldview and then you, that's what arms you you know as you go forward through life so you know this kind of i do like is, how is you beautifully wonderful. threaded that all together because it, it it shows yeah it may start from uncertain axioms in some way but it's not arbitrary it's it's sure not of course yeah the, the meta right. It, it, right it has some it has some its starting point is something substantial uh and just saying it's arbitrary again it's that kind of 
lazy, you know, yeah. dismissive sort of cynicism, Posturing. even yeah, intellectual yeah. laziness. Um, yeah. Hey, Paul, we've gone over for about an hour and a half, but I've yes. got just one go. a purely personal question for you. Sure. Simply because I like, uh, especially uh, kind of like up and coming thinkers, people who are trying to figure these things out. I, I like to ask uh, because you, well, also because you made a video call. <laughs> this is rather, rather essential. You said, uh, what am I doing with my life? And this channel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, yes, I, yes. I, I, well, so let me, let me, uh, and we can probably end off on that note. And yeah. before we do, before I do ask you the question, Paul, I want to say, mate, mate, I'm extremely grateful. Thank you so much for. Yes, uh, this was great. Practice. Really appreciate it. I learned so much. Uh, and again, yeah, I do appreciate the advice. It, it meant a lot. Yes, well, and and you, you, um, uh, your questions made me feel good because it made me feel like I'm more intelligent than I really am. So I appreciate you. Uh, letting me struggle through my explanations because it does help me, you know, organize my thoughts on my end. Um, so I really appreciate it. Oh, for sure. I mean, this is like uh, one reason free speech is it's not just a political right or some kind of yep. uh, legal right. It, it, we probably need it to survive. We yeah, probably need certainly to people well. like you and I do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because we are all over the place, right? It's in our nature. Yep. We're very right. highly, highly open and we need some kind of way to be coherent in our thoughts i think exactly speech of conversation and writing really helps yes uh, definitely uh but no i'm i'm really grateful paul and um look i had a lot more so uh another good video you made was on uh jordan it was titled jordan peterson's most complex and powerful idea explained and what you were talking about was the uh, symbolic substrate i believe yes uh, the metaphorical oh, oh, substrate. sorry yes me metaphorical substrate uh, I want to get into that a bit, bit, bit more deeply, but I think that warrants a conversation of its own uh, because I kind of do want to watch because you 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 did uh, rep, like use a clip from the debate he had with uh, who is Matt Dillahunty. Matt Dillahunty. Not not a big fan. Not gonna lie. I think uh, I me think, neither. Yeah, I, I don't think he. I think he's just a good debater. That's all. And a lot of people yes. are debated. So. Yes. So he'll yes. he'll make a good politician, but that's that's pro probably <laughs> yeah probably it's not it. saying much <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not saying much exactly uh yeah so i want to i want to uh, talk about that and then i kind of want to maybe this isn't as uh, it, it doesn't have as much salience as that but the one you made on uh, philosophy tube who also is a youtuber mm. i like quite a lot i think uh, she makes some pretty good videos yeah definitely. but again yeah her criticisms criticisms seemed a bit they they weren't even real criticisms in some sense you know like for example yep. uh you pointed it out really well where she says if i set my life in order it doesn't mean everything will go perfectly but that's not what peterson says peterson never says that if you exactly. clean your room suddenly you have no problems uh right uh, if, if he said something that naive pre people pr probably wouldn't listen to him in the first place yeah um so yeah man i would again i'm um, sorry i'm again going all over the place i uh, would love no to worries chat about these things but so let me ask you to sort of conclude this video um yeah or this uh, conversation what are you <laughs> doing with your life and, and yeah. your channel where, where what yeah where do you see yourself going yeah i was talking about this with my parents uh just yesterday actually oh that's lovely um well you know in the most abstract sense my you know my goal is to live a meaningful life that is literally the most abstract sense. It's a, it's almost a pointless uh, description of what I want to do. Um, I want to learn and I want to grow. And specifically with this YouTube channel, the more I grow it, the more opportunity I have to speak to different people, such as yourself. But you know, if I get it to a certain point, um, I could just shoot an email to a philosophy professor or a biology professor, and then come on. They can come on the podcast, and I can ask them questions directly that are unique to my experience that I just want to know the answers to. And if they happen to be helpful for people, great, but otherwise it's informative for me, right? So there's a practical element of that with the YouTube channel. Um, but, you know, I guess more like ult more broadly than that, you know, I, going back to like, I, I am trying to explore ideas on this channel, but ultimately I'm trying to make an impact, right? It's not just talking, right? Uh, you know, there, uh, there, there is call to action, you know, what implicit in sometimes explicit, but, you know, implicit in a lot of my videos of like, stand up against this or stand up for this you know and here's why and it's like you know you can say i'm wrong and fair enough 
but yeah, you know, the video is my attempt to convince people one way or another. So it's, it's not a, it's not a purely just neutral sort of objective exploration of ideas. Just sometimes it is um, for certain areas, but ultimately it's grounded in a, I'm worried about political polarization. I'm worried about the future of the world um, as I'm sure everyone is. Um, and so, you know, we need as many people as possible speaking up for what they believe is true and then comparing and contrasting with other people who are doing the same. And if we're all oriented towards the same positive goal, then we can kind of help each other iron it all out and get other people on board, you know? So I think that's what I'm trying to do ultimately. And that requires courage, doesn't it? Mm, yeah. Yes. Well, you, you know, like we talked about at the very beginning, you know, um, there are people who are very, have very strong opinions in the opposite direction of mine um, who, would le- who would probably be very happy if um, my channel did not exist or whatever. So yeah, you know, I, you know, I could, I have friends or former friends, um, whoops, former friends or people I went to high school with or college with who vehemently disagree with me. And, you know, so, uh, you know, making a video and then posting it to my Facebook or something like that, it's like, I know it's going to upset people but I believe this is right. So, so your I'll conscience, accept, you, you listen to your conscience. Yes. And I have to then accept the consequences of what I say. And if I am wrong, because if I think I'm right, but if I actually try to be wrong, well, I have to have courage that I'm, I'm capable of, you know, facing that consequence and then overcoming it. Amen to that brother. Uh, I totally agree. Amen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks Paul. Thank you. Raul. It was a, it was a great chat. Yes, really appreciate it. I look forward to our next conversation for sure.